Thank you so much for joining us. In honor of Women's History Month and International Women's Day, Acker is thrilled to present our Women in Wine series available to stream on our Instagram and YouTube channels. So please subscribe to experience all of our incredible content. We have an incredible roster lined up of some wonderful women who are invigorating the wine industry. My name is Lily Mirabel Friedman, and I'm honored to be joined today by the one Barolo girl of the Barolo boys and the owner and winemaker of E. Pira in Barolo, Chiara Bosques. Thank you so much for joining us today, Chiara. Where are you? Hi, thank you for inviting me for this uh, event. I'm very glad that uh, there is more and more attention on the other side of the moon aspect <laughs> of the world, of the wine world. So, so I'm here in Tarolo in the winery. How is 2021 shaping up in Piedmont? Well, beside all the disaster going uh, going over all, all around the world. I have to say that Mother Nature's make his way. Uh, doesn't matter what humans uh, are doing. So we keep on working in the vineyard because uh, the flowers are flowering and they don't know about COVID and they don't know about all our problems. So we keep on working. We have almost finished pruning, which is uh, a very important and crucial uh, work and aspect for preparing the new production of the year. Perfect, so I'll start kind of from your history and what was it like growing up as a daughter of a winemaker, especially since historically so much of wine's tradition is passed from father to son? I have to say that I, I, had, I lived a very exciting period of the history uh, of my country, of course, but also of the women uh, liberation because uh, when I was uh, very young, the um, women were still seen uh, as, uh, you know, kind of property of their family or the husband or anyway, so not really as an individual itself, even with some great exception, of course, but the general, in general, uh, women were considered um, uh, to get married and uh, abandon the family and follow the husband. And that's why my family, which was one of the historical Barolo makers uh, in, uh, in, in Barolo, um, they were not counting uh, on me. Uh, and, they, and of course, uh, the winery was left to my two boys' brothers. But uh, growing up, uh, you know, I had the the, the good luck that my family sent me to the university, so I studied. And uh, so in only one generation difference, my parents couldn't study because their youth was destroyed by the war, by all these things. So, and uh, from them, with no instruction, to my generation with uh, a degree or university degree in my pocket was a big jump. And of course, uh, the study helped me a lot to think about uh, what I wanted to do, what I wanted to be. And um, so the freedom that I've been given, offered, was, uh, was very important. It's true that I had to gain and to struggle to get my position a lot, because as I told you, women were supposed to get married and so. Mm, and um, first I had to understand myself what I really wanted to do in my life. And I have to say that the example of my parents, the love that my parents show on, the, on this wine world was so contagious that uh, I fall in love with, uh, with this world. And uh, even if I grow up and I studied and uh, I didn't want it to go anywhere else. I really wanted to be a farmer and to be a winemaker. So little by little, I define my position and my ideas uh, Mm, concentrating in uh, in what I wanted to be. And so I started also to complain with my parents for the fact that I was involved, not involved in the family winery. And that's why when I had the opportunity to uh, take advantage of this uh, offer to take over this small uh, uh, jewel or winery in Barolo because the old owner unfortunately died and the two sisters that were 
a little bit older and they were not winemaker. So they feel like uncomfortable and ask uh, help to my parents. Uh, and at this point, after one year in which my parents helped them to do the work in the vineyard and in the cellar, they offer uh, my, my father to take over the winery. And of course, my father had already the winery. And this was the point in which I started to push. And uh, luckily, I was able to convince my parents to support me to take over the winery. And that's why it was possible, thanks to their support, to make a mortgage uh, with the bank that gave me the opportunity to take over the winery. And then uh, I was very lucky because uh, um, with the end of the 80s and the beginning of the 90s, there was a big uh, wind of revolution blowing on the Lange. Not only for the women, for, for women, because I was the first woman winemaker in the, in, back then in the world, um, but also for really for the approach of making wine. So uh, a group of young winemakers that I was honored to be part of, the famous Barolo Boys. Uh, and so they started to get together to try to investigate and uh, find out the way to improve uh, our, um, our product, our wine, to improve also our position. Because in the past, uh, being a farmer means uh, to be really the last step in the social scale. So we wanted to change this perception that the people had of this work that to be honest, is the most, is very, very important because we have the health of the people in our hand. You know, at, uh, at the end, we can still make a living without the smartphone, but we cannot make a living without a good food and so, or, or good wine. So that's why, Mm, we really were conscious of the fact that our position had to be considered more important than what was before. And for this reason, we work very much in trying to increase the quality and uh, also to let the people know that we were doing all this effort. And being young for us was almost a fun to work hard in the vineyard, work hard in the cellar, but also work hard outside to do tasting and involve uh, people to try our wine. Barolo back then in the late 80s uh, or the beginning of the 90s was, was not so famous like today at all. So if you, was, if you were going in the world, on the wine list of the world, there were not, uh, there were not many Barolo. So sometimes not even one. So we wanted to go there. We wanted to put the Barolo at the right place uh, that uh, this wine, great wine deserve. And so we started to, to go abroad. Uh, and uh, of course, in the United States was one of the first uh, country we went to because uh, people, uh, there has no preconcept pre ideas. And uh, uh, so when uh, something is good, people say, yeah, I like it and, and they buy. So we found a lot of support there. there. But it was a great movement of great revolution that included uh, almost 20 years of hard work, experimental, uh, first in the vineyard and then in the cellar as well. And so the concept of Barolo was completely changed. And uh, we started to focus on trying to have a wine that uh, combined the elegance, that the, um, the identity uh, and the quality all together to make uh, a unique uh, product uh, that uh, make a lot of people fall in love with. You're so passionate about Barolo and about farming, and I know how much time you spend in the vineyards after visiting you in Barolo. Was there ever some time when you were maybe only like eight years old where you dreamed of having another career outside of wine or outside of farming? Was there anything else that spoke to you? Or was it always you wanted to be in the wine world somehow? Well, you know what? Uh, uh, being a daughter of uh, farmers and winemakers, I was always involved since very young. So even uh, when I was uh, five, six, eight, um, my mother would take me to the vineyard to harvest or uh, took me in the cellar to, I don't know, to work. But for me back then it was more like a, a, a play 
So what was good is that uh, the, the work was uh, taken as a part of the family history. And so for me, it was really a game and uh, it was fun. And also I remember always this bucolic aspect because uh, uh, my mother was a great cook. So she was inviting parents, relatives, uh, friends uh, to help uh, also. And I always have these memories of a lot of fun of people seated around the table to talk and sing or even in the vineyard to sing. And uh, so for me it was a play. And I grew up with this uh, fascinating or fascination of, uh, of being a farmer. I mean, that's certainly so, part, of, part of the reason that I got into this business is seeing how much fun people had and tasting wine and kind of the experiential aspect of meeting people like you and then having a meal with them and tasting wine and that sort of community that comes around the wine, the wine itself, but so many other aspects around it. So I know that what made the Barolo Boys so great and what was really a large part of that movement was getting to travel all over the world and also tasting a lot of wines. Was there ever, was there a pivotal wine that you tasted with Rivetti and with the Barolo boys that really inspired your own winemaking? Well, of course, the first, uh, we were very passionate about French wine. So especially in Burgundy, we felt ourselves uh, like at home because there was uh, the same situation, small farmer with a great terroir and um, a great, uh, how to say, I mean, even this very small producer were, were famous all over the world. And uh, this uh, was uh, very much inspiring for us. But of course, um, uh, in the time, uh, uh, many, many new region came out uh, with the uh, production of a high quality. So uh, it's uh, the world of good wine today is very vast. And um, there is a lot of fun. I mean, you can really have a lot of fun. But no, no one specific wine that you remember tasting and thinking, I want to model my wines after this, or I could take this element from it and try to interpret that in my own kind of vision. One wine is not enough because, uh, of course, uh, there's not only one wine. But uh, of course, I remember we were getting together, being good friend. We were putting all our money, combining the resources together, and we were buying the most expensive wine on the market to understand what was the secret, you know, just by tasting. And so um, there were many, many great wine uh, that uh, inspired me. So from Burgundy, Bordeaux, from uh, Germany. I mean, uh, um, growing up, uh, the, the, the great wine, are, there's not only one, one wine, you know. Of course. So you had a, a very unique career path kind of getting your own winery that was not part of your family, but that your family encouraged you to be a part of. So what have been the greatest challenges in building your own career? As I told you, because being a woman back then was not uh, normal. So people would look at me with the suspiciousness. You know, today is uh, normal. And a lot of women have taken their position in, uh, in the winery. Uh, in winery uh, to every level. And uh, I have to say that the women's are fantastic. Uh, so, but back then it was not normal. So I had to work the double to look like, uh, to be able to compete. Uh, so for me, what I have to say that I've always been uh, very competitive uh, since uh, when I was very young, uh, because it, I grew up in a, in a world that was uh, man oriented. So I really knew that if I wanted to have my space, I had to fight. Definitely. That's a, a great kind of message to give to people that you have to fight as hard as you can to have something of your own, perhaps. So, yeah. And also, you know what is also the dedication. I mean, it cannot be just a spot. So I've been working like crazy for 20 years, years after years to perform always at the highest level. But this means uh, a life uh, out of the of the light. You know, you are not under the the light, but uh, you are when you are in the cellar, when you are in the vineyard, on an everyday 
work uh, which has nothing of glamorous uh, but uh, still you know that doing this day by day you can arrive to the final goal so it's a matter of dedication and constant uh, work this is very important did you ever have a mentor specifically one in the wine industry Yes, of course. Uh, at the beginning, when I met the Barolo boys, I became uh, leader by leader, a very good friend of some of the big lions. You were talking about Giorgio Rivetti before. He's a great friend, but he was also my mentor. He, I always remember when uh, I invited him over to try the wine and see the cellar, and he was saying to me, Chiara, you're sitting on a Ferrari, but you're going too slow. You're going like, you're driving like, you're not driving a Cinquecento, you're driving a Ferrari. So <laughs> put the speed on. And, um, and then Domenico Clerico and so, and uh, all these big producer that become very good friend that I still today I can call uh, and ask a suggestion or or um, ideas and uh, anyway but yeah Giorgio was very important for me because he really pushed me because uh, back then uh, at the beginning because of course uh, being a woman I was kept uh, uh, in more in the ignorant side and so he really pushed me and uh, and teach me actually you know how to work in the cellar how to put a pipe on uh how to do the work definitely well I, it's, so i he's very good friend uh, of mine still today you spoke a little bit about determination and your competitive edge is there a, another trait that is your favorite trait about yourself or are those kind of the two big ones Yes, I, there is another thing. I, I still maintain uh, this kind of uh, idealism that I had when I was young. What I notice is normally people when get older, they lose the idealism that you have when you're young and become very material and very, you know, down to earth. Luckily, I still fly in the clouds, <laughs> which sometimes, sometimes is negative, I know, but, uh, but most of the time make me make me do a, a better life because I'm always, you know, ready you know, to do the battle of the life, <laughs> the new revolution, like now the organic farming, uh, for example, uh, the combination of this idealism and the deter and determination uh, gave me the possibility to convince the entire producer of Kanubi to accept the organic, uh, um, the organic protocols. And uh, because, you know, having a small, small it's uh, less than one actor place in uh, Kanubi. And if you are organic, uh, the problem is your neighbor. So if your neighbors are not organic, you have only two, two possibility. One is if you sacrifice the grape that come from the borders, and uh, you cannot put it together with the others, uh, or you convince your neighbor. And in Kanubi, there was too much sacrifice to take away, to throw away, you know, the grape of the surrounding. So I said, well, I will try this to, to convince my neighbor, which seems, uh, back then seems a mission impossible, but little by little, it worked out. Yeah, when did you start converting Kanubi to be uh, organic? What year was that? Okay, well, I've always been organic and I asked certification in 2010, okay. but in 2014, I met uh, this guru of the organic and uh, I asked support to him to, to convince the other way maker. You need someone with a, a lot of karma. So I had on my side uh, the reputation for being a good way maker. And uh, I was able to show, especially in 2014, that was a very challenging vintage. Vintage, I made a very good wine and I got very good scores. So on my side, I had uh, this uh, weapon, you know, to convince the other winemaker because uh, uh, when the people were telling me, oh, it's not possible. I said, look, I'm doing it. And on the side, yeah, uh, this uh, guy that is a, a very, very good, very reputed uh, um, agronomist uh, would explain, you know, technically how to make things happen. And that was a big, uh, a big help and big support. So 
so the people feel like more supported because if you say okay you can go on a moon but you say well i don't know how to go on a moon but if someone said okay you do this and you do that and you do that then you can try and uh, actually it make it uh, possible so 2014 was the first year that uh, i started uh, to try to convince people i tried to i tried i tried to make meeting inviting the winemakers uh, and uh, and little by little uh, it turns out uh, positive i think that at the beginning people was listening to me just for for respect but i probably they were going home thinking she's crazy but uh, but little by little they get convinced so i'm very proud of this i don't know if that's necessarily something risky but i'm generally very interested to hear how people approach risk do you consider yourself a risk taker i'm always a risk taker probably this is part of this aspect that i said i have this uh, idealism this side of heroism that uh, comes with it uh, so you don't see the difficulties you just uh, jump on the other side of the you know of the wall don't know don't know what is on the other side of the wall maybe there is a fire but uh, you say okay something will happen and and this is uh, uh, I would say also a little bit of incautions uh, probably uh, that uh, that is very very helpful on this side. Yeah, doing organic farming uh, was definitely a big risk because uh, everybody knows that you have much lower production, much higher risk, and you and you don't know. I didn't know if I could uh, get back uh, of all the investment that I was doing, but since the beginning. You know, I've been uh, investing a lot of money that I didn't have. Well, I took it from the bank, but I think that I had to get it back. And so, and so it was not so easy. Um, I have to say that I'm very positive. I always see my glass uh, half full, not half empty. So, and I think that when you have a positive uh, approach to life, good things arrive. If, if bad things arrive, say, okay, I knew it could happen, but normally it comes very good, very good things. So, and if you are positive, you attract positivity and good things happen. I, when you speak, you're just so enthusiastic and so seemingly motivated and excited about what comes next. But in a year like this, this past year with COVID and all of that, how, how have you done your best to stay motivated and keep that energy up? The vineyard, natural nature gives you the solution you know i've been working i've been doing no travel no people coming to the cellar so i had all my time and i love to be out there in the vineyard i prefer my, much more today i prefer much more to go in the vineyard and actually uh, i try to to be in the vineyard as much as i can and um, i think that when you are out there and you realize that nature goes on they don't care, flowers keep on flowering, you know, things like that. So you realize that, uh, uh, that life goes on and life is beautiful. So we have to take care, but uh, I miss a little bit all the human contact, and this is true, but, um, but I, I had a lot of satisfaction to work hard in the, in the vineyard. Good. What is it specifically, if you could point to one thing, what is it specifically that you love about the wine industry? Uh, because it's a sort of uh, art, artistic thing. Um, you have, uh, I, when I was young, yeah, when you asked me what I was thinking to be, I think that I want to be an artist uh, at the very beginning. Could, uh, you know, I like to paint. Uh, I remember even my teacher, my, in, um, when I was, uh, 10, 11, 12, she was telling to my mother, she's very talented, you should send her to the artistic school. But of course, my mother said, no, we need uh, some uh, couple of hands more in the winery. Uh, but um, yeah, I think I never lost this uh, uh, sort of artistic approach in the, um, even for example, now we are pruning, you know, the approach that I do to the, to the farming is almost like gardening, which has a, a, an aesthetic point of view as well. So I always try to explain to the people that work with me 
that you have to see things with the uh, with the uh, to look for beauty you know uh, beauty um, is important also to sur to survive because uh, because beauty feed not your stomach but your soul so it's very important so the way you put things uh, the way you prune the fact that, that i i plant flowers everywhere the green uh, manure the, the the cover crop mm, i put roses and other plants everywhere where we don't have vines uh, or veggie uh, and uh, you know or even the chicken uh, going around uh, and uh, the nest for for birds so i think that the uh, the more um, diversity is uh, really important and uh, and nature is so beautiful so we have not to rape it we have to cultivate it and people that have the green thumb you know the uh, the gardener knows what I mean by beauty, you know, by cultivated beauty. And good stuff come with the beauty as well. I think something that I want to call out right now is Chiara takes some absolutely beautiful photos of her own vineyards and her animals and the vines on her Instagram that everyone should check out. The photos are, she, she may not claim to be an artist today, but she certainly has a very specifically aesthetic eye for looking at the vineyards and looking at wine really in a beautiful way. And I think that's, that's something that also speaks to your wines as well. Is there a defining moment that changed your career that you can point to and say, this, this thing happened and that's what really set my career off? Yeah, I think that uh, was really meeting the, meeting the, the friend, the Giorgio Rivetti and company and the Barolo boys. Uh, that was very inspiring for me because I like, uh, work with group i like to share experience with other i like also the fun aspect of this work because at the end you know we are not producing piece of metal but we are producing something that we can enjoy ourselves you know that give uh, happiness to to yourself so it's a way sometime i was it's funny because i was thinking oh my god this is work I have fun of making my work, you know, and not so many people can say the same, but when you enjoy your work, when you get fun, when you have uh, excitement from your work, I mean, this is a good luck. So I think that back then, when I started to look at this approach, uh, really changed my, my, my life. And also the fact of never, never think you have arrived, be always open and think, okay, what I have to learn next, what I have to try next. You know, this is also important. Never, never think you have arrived. There are new goals all the time. Yeah, otherwise, yeah. So otherwise I'm, they're finished, you know? Do you ever feel like that winemaking is a very kind of solitary or lonely process to be a winemaker and you've kind of built all these communities to try to combat that feeling of being alone in your cellar or being alone in the vines? It's true. That's true. So uh, we, it's, it's true. I need, I need the social contact. Uh, and uh, I think it's important to really, you're right, to combine the loneliness that you can feel uh, in the cellar or, well, in the vineyard is different. You never feel alone because the plants, even if they don't talk, they talk. So they, they have their own way of talking by showing if they're happy or not. Uh, but yes, but uh, um, before my brother joined me, I've been uh, doing wine in the cellar alone for 20 years. And uh, I feel now uh, I'm very happy that he's helping me and taking me uh, and uh, taking over more, more work in the cellar because I want to be outside. I want to be in the vineyard. Thank yeah, you. I'm done with the loneliness. <laughs> I thought it was a, 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 the right question to ask you as someone who's so, so much about the wine community and how the communal aspect of wine. So what advice would you give to the next generation of female leaders in the wine industry? Oh, the, the new generation must give suggestion to me. No, <laughs> I, can, I can explain what is my experience 
and I can uh, at least say what I have, what has been my mistakes maybe, and how I was able to correct them. But I think that the new generation are fantastic. I think that uh, the world should be led by the younger people because they have the view. They can read where it's not written. And it's true, they have to take over the torch because it's important that, uh, uh, for me, it's always been important to study history, for example, to learn from the past. This doesn't mean that I want to copy the same thing. I need, you need to, to change, but you need the inspiration. So inspiration comes from the past, but the new ideas come in your head. We'll do our best as, as the next generation to try to inspire you in some way, but I don't know yet, so. The, the new generation are fantastic, don't worry. Okay. I, can see, I can see it already right now. Is there another female winemaker who you think is making some really exciting wines right now that you'd like to mention? There are a lot of winemakers, so women winemakers today. So really a lot. I have good friend, uh, I don't know, like Giuliana Clerico, who took over the winery of his husband with a uh, really strong uh, personality. But uh, there are, um, uh, there are in, the, 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 the Chiliuti daughters uh, or the Rocca daughters that uh, are taking over the parents. And, but there is, a, there are many, many, many. Um, the Silvia Altare, who is doing a great job taking over from the father. There are so many today that it's almost impossible to mention uh, everyone. In, and Pied then, in Piedmont, in everyone Barolo, had daughters. The, sorry? In Piedmont, everyone had daughters in this next generation. So it's exactly. all- Exactly, here today. in Barolo, they're all the girls and they're all doing great. Maria Teresa Mascarello, the Rinaldi, so, so many, the, you know, Sandrone, the, I mean, they're all women in power now. A big change. So big, change. Look, big, yeah. Looking past the jumble that is 2020 and 2021, do you have a vision of what's in store for the future of the wine world? I think we are, now we are in standby. So because of this uh, pandemic, uh, there is a kind of urgency to solve this problem that really was a tsunami on the lives of everybody. Uh, but I think the path is already signed. For me, very near my heart is the, the green transaction, so the green revolution. I think that as soon as this problem will be over, we have to concentrate very much in uh, in the creating this green uh, transaction. So there is still people that deny this, but there, there is people that uh, don't let me talk about that. Uh, so, um, but uh, we have a problem. Can we say that? We have a problem, okay? Yeah. So the global warming, all these disaster, nature that rebel against us. We have been uh, polluting water here. We have been even destroying the, the, the ocean. I mean, the ocean is uh, five times the earth and we have been uh, able to, to destroy. We've, we are overfishing, we are polluting with plastic. I mean, it's a total disaster. And, uh, but here again, when I think to a young girl like Greta Thunberg, that she's such a, you know, a small thing, but she comes uh, to, the, to the big people and, uh, and smash them in the face with, uh, with total reason. I mean, because she's right, because the older guy, the rich guy that are becoming so egoist to just want it greedy to have more money 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 and that's it and they don't and and they're stealing the future of the young generation destroying this world and it's not correct so i think we have to go back and punch back very soon so what are your plans particularly perhaps speaking to that exact issue in the next year after now that covid's starting to be a, a memory versus a, something that's happening now. So what are your plans for the next year? To enjoy more for sure, because I've been working, 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 which for me is also part of the fun because I really love my work. And uh, so I, I adore to be in the vineyard. I adore to prune, to green harvest and everything. Even this year, even the harvest is super fun this year because the theaters were closed. I hire a group of artists uh, because they were all unemployed. 
So, uh, and it comes out to be so funny because we had music in the vineyard. We have, uh, we had everything, a, a fire and, uh, and people uh, singing around the fire. No need of expensive thing, just uh, so wine and uh, to the distance, of course, but uh, so I miss the hug. I miss, uh, I miss hugging people. Uh, this is true. And probably we will never get back to that for a long time. But um, yeah, I hope uh, for the future to give more, more hugs. That's awesome. Is there a dream project that you'd like to pursue in the future? Uh, yeah, I think that uh, the work in the vineyard is never, is never finished. And uh, I think that uh, my intention is to work more and more on uh, the on knowing the physiological part aspect of the plants to get more in contact with them to make them more happy and healthy so working more on the uh, on strengthening their natural defense like uh, we do for ourselves you know we have to try to avoid the problem you know like for example now with the covid the only solution because there is not a cure is to get the vaccination so to work in advance uh, so not to get healed because if you get healed you never know how it go goes on so the same approach uh, is uh, is important to do it in the in the vineyard uh, to strengthen with the essential oil with treatment of essential oil of uh, uh, like i was saying to you all these things like the cover crop uh, the birds the nest the uh, the wet zone the flowers the plants whatever so there are a lot of things but we change many things with the for example with passing to the soft pruning the soft um, the soft green harvest so there are continuously new new challenge um, the idea is really to create a world world more in balance and um, more diverse and more healthy so hello oops hello hi we lost your video for a second oh, I think... no worries yeah, 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 because... well chiara the woman with the greenest thumb in all of piedmont perhaps if not the world with big aspirations of trying to fix global warming and change our world little by little. It's been such a pleasure to chat with you today and hear a little bit more about one of Piedmont's female pioneers. And I can't thank you enough for sharing your time with us. And thank you for celebrating Women's History Month and International Women's Day with Acker. And cheers, ciao, grazie mille. Thank you, thank you very much. I hope really to inspire someone because I think the revolution starts really from everybody. So everybody has to do their part. We don't have to expect the big power men to do things for us. We have to do it ourselves first. So I hope, uh, thank you very much for inviting me and uh, see you soon. Ciao. Ciao.